So John, in the prior sections, we explored the wrong, the fraud, the ir irregularities in the election. And in the next section, we explored the remedy for that wrong, the legal remedy. But in this section, the question is, should you and the president have pursued that legal remedy? That's the question of prudence. Now, I want to start with something that we've covered, but for those who haven't seen the prior sections. Um, we want to be clear that you told the vice president not to reject electoral votes. You said that would be foolish, but rather to delay. Maybe you could just quickly explain that. Sure. To delay at the request of more than 100 state legislators who had advised Vice President Pence that there was illegality in their states in the conduct of the election, significant enough to have placed the election in question, that the electoral votes for Biden should not have been certified, and they wanted an opportunity, now that they were back in regular session, to assess the impact of that Ill illegality to determine whether the actual winner of the election had been the one that was certified. Now, after January 6, Pence claimed that he was advised to reject, not delay. Well, his dear colleague letter of the morning of January 6th is very carefully worded. He doesn't say, I advise him to reject. He says, some people have suggested I could just reject. And that was true. I mean, there were articles that had been published uh, that said the vice president had this authority. And, and the president himself had tweeted that you have the authority to just reject fraudulent electors. Um, but the advice I actually gave to him in person on January 4th was that given that the legislators ha had legislatures hadn't certified alternate slates of electors, it would be foolish to exercise that, even if he had that power. And in these circumstances, I thought it was a weaker argument that even he had that power. But the power to accept their request to delay so that they could assess the impact, I thought, was within his authority. Okay. Now, the question of whether it was prudent to go forward depends on a whole host of factors. One of them is Pence. And was there any reason to believe that he would accept your advice? Well, uh, in a memo that Pence's general counsel wrote to him in early December, he had acknowledged the legal scholarship supporting his authority here. So I thought that you know, laid out a credible argument on why he might willing to undertake it. And of course, in discussions that people were having with him and others, he was deliberately not taking a position one way or another. Now, it turns out in hindsight that he wanted to delay as long as possible what would be a pretty significant break with Trump. Uh, uh, and I kind of took stock of him at the meeting on January 4th and realized he wasn't going to do it. But even then, there was still some talk that he might recuse himself and that uh, this president pro tem of the Senate, Chuck Grassley, or the next most senior member of the Senate, uh, might step in and fulfill that and role. The man uh, who was Pence uh, counsel is a man named Greg Jacobs, who you said early in December acknowledged the credibility of some of your arguments. But I think he said that in the two weeks before January 6th, he was adamant that this was a nutty position. Well, Greg Jacob and I never met until January 4th. He never expressed such sentiments to me. Uh, even in our extended meeting on January 5th, uh, we explored the various uh, scholarship or whatever. Uh, if he had those views that they were nutty and that nobody would, would accept those positions, he never conveyed that to me. Now, maybe he and Pence and uh, Pence's uh, chief of staff, Mark Short, had those conversations among themselves, but they certainly didn't have them with me. Now, on <clears throat> January 4th, you met with Pence. You were reasonably convinced that Pence would not accede to your advice. You went and told Rudy Giuliani. You told Mr. Giuliani, Pence isn't going to go along. So at that point, should you have abandoned this plan? Well, again, at that point, it was still up in the air whether he would recuse himself or not. Um, so the, the question about whether whoever was sitting in that chair 
would take this advice, we remain very much open. Uh, and, and more importantly, I mean, look, if, if I'm right about the illegality and the fraud, we're talking about one of the biggest political scandals in American history. And it goes back, it goes back five years. Even on the 4th, Pence did not foreclose the delay option. I had a sense that he wouldn't. Greg Jacob testified that he repeatedly said he would not go along with that. That's not true. And he just said, I'll take it under advisement. I'll continue to meet and we'll continue to discuss these things. And my staff will meet with Dr. Eastman uh, tomorrow as well. So, so the, the, the claim that he repeatedly told me and the, and the president that he would not do this because he had no authority, that's just utter, uh, utter, utterly false. Because I think there are a lot of people, I at one time among them, thought, gee, there's a zero chance that you're going to get Pence to delay. But once you asked him, it was going to get out and you were going to feed the Trump overturning the election narrative. Well, when, when he says he's going to take something under advisement, my sense was that he was not going to take it. But he was very deliberately avoiding saying that. And, and if I was persuasive at the meetings the next day, he led me and, more importantly, President Trump to believe that he, would, that he would take seriously the arguments and reach a judgment. All I can do is take him at his word. Now, one of the other considerations is, did the legislatures really have enough time in seven to 10 days to make a reasonable assessment? Look, we've had recounts and audits taking months and years. So what would you expect in seven to 10 days? So, there's no question that in seven to 10 days, they could not definitively resolve how many ballots were affected by illegality and fraud. I mean, we're still just debating those questions. But they could determine in that seven to 10 days, was there in fact illegality? And how much potential fraud did that open the door for? And if it's bigger than the outcome of the election, can we make an assessment, an educated guess about what the results of that election would have been but for the illegality. We can't do it definitively, but because of the illegality, the actual burden of proof shifts back on those that are supporting the certification with the illegality that the illegality didn't affect the outcome. And I think the legislature, even in seven to 10 days, had they been willing to address this, uh, could have made that assessment. Would it have been a perfect, uh, you know, like a like an accounting sense of your bank records? No, we're never going to get that level of perfection. But could it be based on reasonable extrapolations and suppositions? I believe it could have been. Okay, we discussed this <clears throat> earlier, and I'm wondering if this is the kind of thing they could have done. They looked at rejection rates that were 4% <clears throat> normally, were one-tenth of that in this election. <clears throat> they can infer the number of votes that would have been rejected, and then make some reasonable estimate of what the effect was on the outcome. That's the kind of thing that they can do. That's, and in fact, courts have done this in, in a relatively short period of time as well. But it's just a judgment they make, presumably on good evidence, but it doesn't, it's not at any particular legal standard. I think that's right, yep. So let's assume that the legislature or legislatures came to the view that it was Trump, not Biden, that had been elected. Now, what do they do? Well, they, they say our original certification based on illegal votes was wrong. Here's the correct certification. This is exactly what happened in Hawaii in 1960. There was an election challenge. They determined after the fact, and after the Electoral College had met and voted, that in fact, Senator Kennedy, rather than Vice President Nixon, had won that state. They quickly sent a supplemental or a replacement certification to Congress, and Richard Nixon, presiding over the joint session of Congress, decided to count that slate rather than the original Nixon slate of electors. He did it unilaterally. He didn't have a vote so in Congress. So that, you think, is in support of the VP count. Now, now he says, I don't want to set any precedent here, but in fact, he, he, set, a, he set a precedent. And he did it unilaterally. He did it in violation of the Electoral Count Act because the Electoral Count Act says the, the electors certified on the designated day um, are to be counted uh, unless both houses of Congress agree that they were not regularly given. And both houses of Congress didn't even have a chance to vote on it. So it was a violation of the Electoral Count Act. 
Now, they could certify Trump, but could they not certify either slate? They could not certify either slate. And, uh, and then the question is, there's a different legal question that remains unsettled. Um, does that change the total number of electors who have been appointed uh, such that a majority of electors necessary to win drops from 270 to some number lower than that, and whoever has a majority at that lower number would be elected? Or are they considered appointed but just not counted, and you would still need 270, neither gets 270, and it goes to the House? That's another very significant constitutional question that has never been resolved. Now, there are other things that you had to take into account. Um, mobs. There's a man named Hirschman. Who was that? Eric Hirschman was a, a, a counselor to the president uh, in the White House at the time. Not in the White House counsel's office, as far as I can tell, but just one of these special assistants to the president. Now, I think in the January 6 committee hearings, he told you that your plan was completely crazy, that you were out of your effing mind, these are all quotes, and you were going to cause riots in the streets. Now, he has you saying in response, well, there have been riots before, and sort of the implication that you were a little bit cavalier. Well, Mr. Hirschman has two things. He's got a vivid imagination. I, uh, in, my, in my relatively few dealings with him, I discovered that he sometimes thinks he says things in his mind, and then he portrays it as if he actually said them. But he also said in that same sworn testimony that this occurred well before January 3rd in personal one-on-one -on -one meetings with Eastman in the White House. Now, I was not in D.C. until the evening of January 3rd, and I was not at the White House until the afternoon of January 4th. So those conversations never occurred. But were there anybody in the White House who expressed sentiments like that? None, none. There was a meeting I had while we were waiting for Vice President Pence to arrive for the Oval Office meeting with President Trump. I was in Mark Meadows' office with Eric Hirschman, with uh, Pat Cipollone, and I believe with Pat Philbin, the Deputy uh, White House Counsel. I, I can't remember whether he was the fourth one there or not. And, and we, were, we were sitting on the couch and in the chair in Mark Meadows' office and just, just chatting. There was no conversation about the substance of our recommendation. And most certainly no one said, Eastman, your views on this are crazy. Don't present them to the president. That conversation, nothing like that conversation occurred. Were there any people in the White House who were supportive? No, again, the only people that I met with were those five, and we didn't have a substantive but I mean, conversation. Mark Meadows didn't tell you his views? He didn't tell me his views. Uh, uh, Pat Cipollone uh, walked in with me to the o Oval Office meeting and was excused by the president. Mark Meadows came in subsequently. And where was and, the president in all this? He was in the Oval Office uh, at, behind the Resolute Desk. And Mark Meadows came in. Uh, during and by this meeting. time, he'd been talked down from rejecting. No, well, not when he excused Pat Cipollone. Uh, uh, or Mark Meadows came in, I think, early on. And he, uh, he needed something that Mark went out to and this get. this was January 4th. January 4th in the Oval Office meeting. So it was just the president, the vice president, uh, Mark Short, Greg Jacob, and me in that meeting. And at that point, Trump was still insisting or trying to insist that Pence reject. Well, he had, he had, he had some of these scholarship, scholarly articles, which I believe he'd read by then, and other people that had uh, urged that the vice president had the authority to reject contested electors. Uh, and, uh, and, and the president said, now you agree with that, right, John? And I said, well, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and, uh, I, and I think more nuanced. And then that's when the vice president asked me directly. Now, people are going to be very surprised that Trump reads law review articles. Are you being <laughs> straight faced there, John? I am. You know, in my dealings with him over the, over the course of the month of December and early January, um, he, he, uh, he, receives and absorbs a lot of information fairly quickly um, and on something as important as that I don't have any doubt that he would have read at least portions of the articles. You don't get to be president of the United States without having some measure of, of uh, intellectual capabilities. He also doesn't sleep very much and he doesn't drink and he doesn't smoke. I mean uh, the guy uh, the guy's a workhorse. Now let's stay on mobs. 
because clearly that was a consideration. And so you had to think through what would have happened had there been riots on the street, and it's likely there would have been. So now, how do they get quelled? Normally it would be the military, but the military didn't show a lot of support for Trump in the 2020 riots. Well, uh, one hopes that our military still understands their obligation and the chain of command that stops at the top with the commander in chief. Um, we, we had some members of the military that I think uh, uh, made questionable statements even with our enemies abroad about their role in making sure that the, the president, their boss, the commander in chief, the only one with constitutional authority, uh, wouldn't do anything. So, Did you consider the possibility that if there were riots on the street, the military would actually escort Trump out of the White House? <clears throat> no. Uh, uh, the conversation at the time was if we got to January 20th and Biden had been certified as the president and Trump refused to leave, would he be escorted out? I, th th those were stories that were being floated in the left-wing press. There was zero possibility of Trump refusing to leave, and that would even become a necessary contingency. More seriously, though, and one of the conversations I did have with Eric Hirschman was uh, after January 6th when I said, you know, the Georgia case was, was uh, the federal case was settled against us on Tuesday. We have grounds for an appeal, and I think it's important to get the necessity of having election challenges heard brought up on the appeal, even though the case is otherwise now moot. There's a doctrine in law called capable of repetition yet evading review. That's an exception to mootness. And he said, you know, all I want to hear from you is, uh, is uh, No, are you, uh, talking peaceful... about, are you talking about the Georgia case that's pending now? No, no, different case in Georgia. Okay. This was our federal action we filed on New Year's Eve to, to say they're not even letting a judge be appointed in the state election challenge. This is now violating federal due process. And we filed that action. And okay. he said, the only thing I want to hear from you is peaceful transition. And he also raised, at some point, Who's either that, he at that uh, point? Eric Hirschman. And he also raised at some point, um, you know, if, if, if there's any effort by the courts to say that Trump won instead of Biden, there'll be riots in the streets. And my recollection, to the best I have it, is that, you know, I'm not even, I don't even recall him talking about that. But if he had, I would have said something like that. We should not succumb to mob rule. Um, that would be mob rule. If, if Trump was the legitimate winner right. and you're afraid of saying that because of mobs' violence, then you're sub subjecting yourselves to mob rule. And that's not the rule of law. Okay. But your assumption going in, yes, there'd be mobs, but the military would be loyal to civil... It's, but again, none of my conversations no, no, dealt you, with that. No, no. But as you're considering yeah. whether to go forward... I assume you took into account the risk of mobs. I didn't get into that. Uh, th this was a different department. Uh, you know, he, uh, Trump himself had uh, authorized the call up of 20,000 members of the National Guard for January 6th. I thought those things were handled. I didn't, it wasn't my role to address those things and I didn't give them uh, much consideration. <clears throat> but as a matter of prudence, and you're in this case in this context, not just a lawyer, you're a political advisor. Uh, don't you have to take into account those kind of potential consequences? Well, you, you do. And to that extent, um, my earlier answer stands. If we should not avoid taking the necessary right step to ensure the, the rightful outcome of the election because of fear of violence by a mob, because then that's mob rule. That's the antithesis of the rule of law. And we give up much greater than the loss of a single election and a single office holder if we succumb to mob rule and lose the rule of law in the process. Okay. Another objection, I think, was this. If he delays, the Dems go to court, the Supreme Court, and, according to somebody quoting you, you said that you'd lose 9-0. Yeah, so that's a distortion of the conversation. Uh, so with whom? With Greg Jacob on January 5th. We were there talking about whether uh, a decision to delay, if it was challenged in court, would be a non-justiciable political question that the courts would reject. And Greg Jacob got me to agree that if he just simply rejected electors outright, which would be equally a non-justiciable political question, 
the court would very likely find a way to rule anyway, and 9-0 would rule against that. And I agreed. But then in that same email exchange, I said, but were he merely to delay, I think there's a fair prospect that I would win a majority of the court saying that he could do that, or at least deciding that it was that they wouldn't reach the question, non-justiciable. Now, we've been going through the various factors that bared on whether you wanted to pursue this. The biggest one is the current circumstances in the country, the political and social condition. Now, by way of comparison, in the 1960 election, there's pretty good reason to believe that the election was stolen for Nixon. The conventional thinking, and I know you don't totally accept the conventional thinking, but the conventional thinking uh, is the standard, and people will use it to compare to Trump. The conventional thinking is Trump, no, Trump, Nixon said, for the good of the country, I'm not going to pursue these charges. Before we get to 2020, let's have a brief stopover in 2000. Okay. Because, because the claim is that Al Gore, in conceding after Bush versus Gore rather than continuing to fight, exhibited the same kind of, for the good of the country, statesmanship, let's put an end to this. Um, I think that uh, attributes to both of them a greater magnanimity than is warranted. You look at Nixon's situation and every path, Every judge in Texas, every judge in Illinois uh, were Democrats. There was no way that he was going to be able to bring election challenges that would result in his victory. And so if he did challenge and loses anyway, uh, uh, then he's put the country through a lot without any, any resolution uh, it, it to the correct judgment. Same thing with Gore. I mean, we know for a fact that his folks had looked at every path, what happens if it gets to Congress, the joint session, what happens if it gets sent to the House of Representatives, and in every path he loses no matter what happens in the litigation. So I, I don't want to give as much magnanimity of thought to either well, one of them. But, but let's assume the standard version and that Nixon is magnanimous. Certainly not in 1960, but also not in 2000, were the stakes about the very existential threat that the country is under as great as they are. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, handing over to John Kennedy instead of Richard right. Nixon, who's going to deal with the Cold War. Um, we're, we're, we are talking about whether we are going to, as a nation, completely repudiate every one of our founding principles, uh, which is what the modern left wing, which is in control of the Democrat Party, believes that we are the root of all evil in the world and we have to be eradicated. This is an existential threat to the very survivability, not just of our nation, but, but of the uh, example that our nation properly understood provides to the world. That's the stakes. And Trump seems to understand that in a way a lot of Republican establishment types in Washington don't. And it's the reason he gets so much support in the hinterland, in the flyover country. People are fed up with folks, you know, get along, go along, while the country is being destroyed. And so I think the stakes are much bigger. And, and, and that means a stolen election that thwarts the will of the people trying to correct course and get back on a path that understands the significance and the nobility of America and the American experiment is really at stake and we ought to fight for it. I'm assuming that if the conditions that obtained in this early 60s obtained now, you might not have I, made. I, I, may, I may have come to a different conclusion. And look, our founders lay this case out. The prudential judgment they make in the Declaration of Independence is the same one. There's actually a provision in the Declaration of Independence that says, you know, a, a, a people will suffer abuses while they remain sufferable, or tolerable while they remain tolerable. Hmm. But at some point, the abuses become so intolerable that it is not only their right, but their duty to alter or abolish the existing government. So that's the question. Have the abuses and the threat of abuses become so intolerable uh, that we have to be willing to push back? To what degree are the differences between you and others on the fraud and the legal matters a function of a very different assessment of where we stand today? So I had, I had one of my longtime friends call me and say, you know, you got to quit with this Eastman, you know, it's, it all will blow over, just write a book, you'll make a lot of money and everything will be fine. And I told him, I said, you really don't understand the stakes of what we're dealing with. And I don't know how you can miss it because it's just there for anybody with eyes to see. The narrative is 
Eastman and Trump tried to initiate a coup. Isn't that the narrative? Well, and I actually published an article saying trying to, trying to stop an illegal election is not a coup, but trying to thwart a coup. Um, but the fact that that true narrative is being censored and shut down so that the false narrative can prevail uh, is, I think, part of the existential threat. And it's not just shut down. It's, it's shut down any people that raise legitimate questions about the validity of the election. And, well, and you're a good example. And unfortunately, this censoring and deplatforms de comes almost as much from the right as from the left. Let's, let's kind of distinguish the right. We've got uh, what our friends at the Claremont Institute like to call conservatism, Inc. The, the establishment conservatives, uh, they're, they're very much a part of the establishment. And, and what Trump, and more importantly, what, what the movement that Trump got ahead of. Remember, it was not called the MAGA movement until Trump came along. It was the Tea Party movement. It's the same movement. Right. It's the same, goes back to 2008 or 2010, they don't want the federal government controlling our health care, <laughs> you know, taking over one sixth of the nation's economy. They don't want command and control. They don't want OSHA telling me what what kind of chair I can have in my home office. All of they don't want them telling me that I can't have gas stoves in my kitchen. They're tired of that. That was a Tea Party movement, and the Republicans were as much opposed to the Tea Party populist uprising against what was happening and coming out of Washington as the Democrats were. And Trump got ahead of that movement, and it's now called the Make America Great a movement, uh, 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 again, movement. But, but that's what the establishment in D.C., or more broadly, the Northeast Corridor, if you will, to bring in New York. Um, uh, <laughs> Please that, do. That's, that's, that's what they want to stop, mm -hmm. partly because they think they're smarter than the average American, and therefore the average American just ought to bend the knee to whatever comes out of the expert. And th this is just a fruition of that 100-year effort, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, come to a rapid conclusion. I mean, it kind of right. went, there were a couple of bumps when it increased quickly, but, but you look at that curve and it's been an exponential increase in the last few years. You're gonna let 50-year-old men naked into teenage girls' showers at public pools. Oh, or, or, or drag queens doing story hours to six-year-olds. If I had said that 10 years ago, you would have laughed me out of the room, and you, you would have said, Eastman, you're way out on a limb and you're crazy. Anything more? No, I, I, I would just you know, kind of bring it all together in this way. The amount of information about illegality I thought was clear-cut. That opened the door for fraud. And I think both the statistical evidence and the anecdotal evidence, if I had about people engaging in that fraud because the door had been opened to it, was significant enough to have altered the results of the election. And then the question is going to be, is there any legal remedy to deal with a stolen election? Um, and I put together the best legal arguments that I thought uh, were plausible to, to, to deal with that. But I did that because I thought the stakes were high. And I thought... Uh, if we do not address the illegality here, what we're going to see is they're, I mean, they use the institutions of government to affect the outcome of that election in ways that we now know. The Twitter files, the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop, those were done with collusion with agencies of the United States government putting a big thumb on the scale of the election. And, and, and they did that when, you know, when the incoming president was going to be able to call him on it. And they continued to do it after the boss was their enemy. <laughs> right. um, and, and if they can do it that time, when they then get a boss who's in agreement with them, then there are no longer you know, any impediments to them preventing us from ever having a fair election again, which means there are no impediments to them blocking the consent of the governed, having control of the direction of the government. And we no longer are free people. Right. I mean, those are the stakes. And if those are the stakes, you know, what are you supposed to do? Just, just sit around and twiddle your thumb? Eh, it, it would be too messy to, to do anything about this. I'll just, you know, and maybe when the alligators come for everybody else, they'll eat me last. <laughs> no, that's not my nature. I'm the one out there on the rampart. If they eat me first, at least I've gone down fighting. Would you work for Trump again? You know, if the President of the United States calls on you for service to the country, 
and there's a viable path to provide that service, I think every citizen should be able to answer that question, yes. Most conservatives, now I guess I'm talking on the coasts, intellectuals, would say, look, we got to get beyond 2020, stop litigating that, and let's look forward. Isn't that the... Yeah, that's the mantra, certainly out of the Michigan legislature, a significant portion out of the Wisconsin legislature. And, and my view of that is, if in fact what I've said is true about 2020, if you don't highlight it in order to put brakes on it, they'll do it again in 2024, and you'll never have a free election Now, again. Are, are Republicans prepared? Are they going to... No, they're not. The Democrats put $100 million into their litigation efforts, their efforts to alter laws for their benefit, and the Republicans don't put any effort into it at all. They didn't put nearly enough in it in 2020, but as far as I've been able to tell, they haven't taken seriously the So are the you threat. of the opinion that Republicans can't win because of this? They can't win because of this unless they do something about it. And they seem uh, uninterested in doing what's necessary to do something about it. Well, John, this has been fascinating. Perhaps, as I said, one day we'll call these the Eastman tapes. So I, I had a great deal of fun, and I hope you did too. I did too. Let's call them the Eastman Dialogues. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds less Nixonian. <laughs> okay, Eastman Dialogues. Any case, thank you again. Thank Appreciate you very much, Tom. It.